Good morning, friends. Today we'll cover chapter 15, Spark RDD Persistence. As we have learned before that we had uh, Hadoop MapReduce first, which, which came first, and it was a solution for big data back in 2000s, early 2000s. And in that, uh, everything, all the operations, all, all the data was stored in the, in the disk rather than in the memory. That was uh, in MapReduce. But once we have got this Apache Spark, Apache Spark was like much more advanced that by default, instead of storing uh, the data in the in the disk, which, which involves a lot of disk IO, which is like uh, not very performant. So Apache Spark always used to store the data in the memory because memory operations like were, were very fast. And that's the default behavior of Apache Spark. And by uh, uh, once we call about this persist or cache method, the cache methods is by default uh, being called by Spark when we call any actions like reduce by key or group by key. So cache caching, like storing the data in memory, is the default behavior of Apache Spark, which makes it very, very fast. And it's like claimed that it's around like 10x faster or 100x faster than the previous uh, Hadoop MapReduce version. Also in Spark, we have learned before that whenever we call any transformations, for example, when we call map filter, then, th then this RDD, the original RDD, also, we call it as parent RDD. These are transformed into new RDDs. And after that, when we call actions on, on those trans on this transformed ID, uh, RDDs, uh, for example, collect, count, etc. Only then, uh, which is also this is action. The final action is also called a terminal uh, op terminal operation, which means that all those operations which were done before, all those intermediate operations like all those transformations, map filter are only triggered when the action is being called. Before that, it, this is not, uh, none of the operations are being done. Only when action is done, it's very much the same like Java streams. In Java streams also, we have the same concept that all the intermediate operations like map, filter and all, unless we call any action, which is reduce or collect, only then all those previous intermediate operations are being called. So this is the concept about intermediate operations, which are transformations and the final terminal operations, which are actions. So first time it is computed in an action, it will be kept in memory on the nodes. So this is the key point. Whenever any action is called, only then all those intermediate operations are being done. And the resultant, uh, all those intermediate RDDs which are formed, those are stored in memory. This is the default behavior of Apache Spark. This feature also helps in fault, on, uh, fault tolerance because uh, just notice that, I mean, if we have got a partition uh, in which uh, we have got a lot of RDD transformations being done and all are being, uh, and we call an action and all those uh, intermediate RDDs are stored in, in memory, in cache. And uh, because as we know, as we have also noticed that uh, all the data is fault tolerant, it means that it is redundant. All those like nodes are, are copied over to uh, various several other nodes so that in case one of the nodes fails, in that case, the, all those intermediate uh, RDDs which were formed uh, and which were cached in the memory that can be created very, very fastly. That's that makes Spark very fast. Now let's talk about uh, two main functions, which is cache and persist. When cache is called, it means that by default, it uh, the uh, all the data, all the intermediate RDDs or all those operations would be stored in the memory only. It will, it will not be stored anywhere else other than memory. But if you want to use uh, persist, so persist actually has got a storage level as a, as its argument, uh, where we can actually uh, change the behavior. By changing the behavior, we mean that we can either use storage level dot memory only, which is the default behavior when we call cache. So in that case, cache and persist would be behaving same. Uh, if we just use storage level dot memory only in, uh, persist, in, the, in this persist method, otherwise, there are other, uh, there are a lot of other uh, like parameters possible. For example, we have got storage level dot memory uh, and disk, which means that uh, if, if, the, if the data is like spilling over from the memory, memory is not sufficient, then we can spill the data to the disk. So all these type of behaviors, all these type of different type of storage levels uh, can be customized by using this persist method. So being said that, let's revise what are the storage levels possible. So as we discussed that memory only is the is the default behavior when we use cache. And if we are using persist with this uh, storage level dot memory only, that will be having the same behavior as cache. The data would be only stored in the memory. 
And one more important thing is that that how the data is being stored, whether we are going to serialize it, so that I mean by serializing we are compatting it to uh, to Java bytes and then storing it, or we store the deserialized version or the original version of the Java objects. So for the memory only, we are storing it as a deserialized Java objects. We are not performing any serialization. Similarly for memory and disk. So memory and disk, uh, as we discussed, that if the data is uh, like too, too huge to be stored in the memory, then it will spill over to the disk. Now memory only SER, which means that we are only going to store the data in a serialized form. So there are two types of serialization uh, possible, right? Uh, one is the plain Java serialization, uh, where it will just use the Java implemented uh, serialization interface. And the other one is that we can also have some fast serializers, which are, for example, Java, uh, for example, there is a cryo serialization, which is which, which can be used. We will discuss about that later um, in our uh, in later chapters. So there are different type of uh, like selection possible. We can pass our own custom serialization process as well. But just note that if we are using a fast serializer, that would be more CPU intensive, which means that it will require more CPU resources to serialize and deserialize it back. Now, similarly, we have got several other versions that we can also have like memory and disk serialization. I mean, so this one was only for memory. We only store the serialized objects into the memory. And this one is that we serialized, uh, we still store into both memory and disk. And the final version is the disk only. So by disk only, it will not store the partitions uh, in the memory, but only on disk. So this will be having the behavior similar as the previous Hadoop map reduce. And now they have got other versions like memory only to map disk and disk to etc. And uh, which means that uh, it would be using uh, two partitions, each partition on two cluster nodes. So they will replicate it not to only like one partition, but at least to the uh, to each partition on two cluster nodes, two different cluster nodes. Okay, so this is the main. So I think there are other versions like disk uh, only, like two disk only, like three, which we'll cover in our test case very soon. And the final one is the off heap. So this is an experimental behavior, which means that uh, it will it will be not storing it into the Java heap memory, but off memory, which is the concept of uh, so that there should be no garbage collection and uh, impacting the performance. So this is supposed to be uh, an experimental feature because. Uh, if we have uh, this direct uh, memory buffer stuff, I mean, where uh, we are storing the data into outside the heap memory, that will help us to avoid any any GC garbage collection and uh, avoid any performance impact on that. So as we have discussed that there are various trade-offs. I mean, if we are trying to like store the serialized version, in that case, we, it would be uh, very low, uh, CPU intensive. So we should be careful of that, that if, uh, if we have got the worker nodes, uh, which are have got in a pop CPU. So in that case, we can use the serialized version, but it will definitely compact it and then store in the memory. So we will uh, have a lot of space available. So that's a trade-off between the memory usage and CPU efficiency. And also if you are using a lot of like fault tolerance, if you have got a lot of uh, nodes uh, and we need to like replicate the data across all the nodes, in that case also, we have to use uh, the serialized version because only then uh, all those data would be like having also having the network latency to transfer all this all those data to all the nodes for having this fault tolerance behavior. So we have to be uh, very careful uh, that which type of storage level we want to use. If it's too confusing, just use the default, uh, uh, the cache, which is the memory only operation. And it always very fast. I mean, Spark internally, it all it all, all already has got all those like smart, uh, like decision that what to make in base of any type of data or uh, any type of operation that we are performing on it. For example, just they talk about this reduce by key. So, so Spark also automatically persists some intermediate data and shuffle operations. Even if you don't call any like cache or persist level, it is smart enough uh, to use an appropriate uh, like serialization of persistent version to make our application very fast. One thing is that if the data is very, very huge, it's like billions and, tri and trillions or like terabyte, petabyte and all, uh, which is not really the case. In that case, it is advisable to use memory and disk because uh, it's not some, um, sometimes the memory is not enough to like store all the data. So it's advisable to use memory and disk and use the serialized version if the data is very, very, very huge. So use the memory and disk with the serialized version. In that case, the, uh, it will be compacted and stored in both memory and disk. So I think that would be enough. Also, we'll uh, go, uh, go to some uh, GMS benchmarking tests. And besides that, I have also written some unit test case, which we'll uh, cover in the next video. And the last part before we conclude this uh, theory part is that we can also remove the data. 
so for example if we have, if there is a um, by default i mean uh, if, if any data is stored in memory and is not being used so it will be eligible for garbage collection if you are not using the off heap version in that case uh, java will automatically because it's all like scala and java i've just spark so it will automatically uh, trigger those gc algorithms and it will uh, it will do the all the cleanup but in case there there could be uh, something that we we want to like unpersist the data ourselves in that case we have got unpersist method here in the api which which can be used so uh, also i um, mean uh, as mentioned that spark also automatically does a lot of cleaning that uh, it it will drop out the old data using the least recently uh, used lru fashion i mean we have learned about this is a very common algorithm uh, to uh, remove to to make the cache clean by remo by removing all those data which was not used uh, recently the oldest data which is there in the stale which is not uh, fetched yet that would be removed this is the basics of lru okay so this is all about uh, the theory part in the next video we will write some unit test cases and also first time we will be using gmh benchmarking test to perform uh, to measure uh, that what are the different uh, storage level performance and uh, how it can impact the overall performance of the actions like group by key and uh, collect and count so see you all in the next video